Is the holy sacrifice of the mass being destroyed in America, in the world? Has it ever been destroyed in other countries? The answers to these two questions lie in a simple child's understanding of what the true holy sacrifice of the Mass is, and in an elementary knowledge of Catholic Church history. The true holy sacrifice of the Mass is the same sacrifice as the sacrifice of Calvary, and that sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the God-man, can never be destroyed in its essence but its renewal, its redoing over again in an unbloody manner by a validly ordained Catholic priest can be suppressed or taken away from parishes, dioceses, and even whole countries. I shall show by a brief re recounting of church history that this did happen in Germany and England in the 16th century and is happening today. I want you therefore to make the distinction with me that when I mention in this recording the destruction of the mass, I mean to say the attempt at its destruction and what can and does happen as a direct result of that attempt. Faithful Catholics are dedicated to the unceasing battle to preserve without compromise the doctrines and dogmas of the one true Church. Of first and primary concern is the preservation of the holy sacrifice of the Mass in its integrity and according to the Catholic theology of the Mass as it was formulated at the Council of Trent. I am addressing these words to all Catholics who want to remain faithful. You may believe that you have assisted or are going to assist at the holy sacrifice of the Mass as you have in years past in your parish church. But is this true? Is this the same Mass or a diabolical perversion of it? Horrified, you insist it can't be a diabolical perversion of the Mass? After all, it is being said in the same churches we have always attended, and it is being said by priests of the diocese, in many instances by priests who have been in our parishes for years. And you might say, Oh, but I cannot believe that Father would do such a thing. He is such a good, holy man. He couldn't do such a thing. Let me remind you that the Mass was perverted and eventually destroyed in times past by members of the hierarchy and clergy who used Catholic buildings to do so. In the beginning of the 16th century, the European countries were Catholic. There were no other church buildings but Catholic ones. There was no other clergy but the Catholic clergy. And yet, before the end of the 16th century, the sacrifice of the Mass had been destroyed in some of the European countries, notably Germany and England. And the Catholic people were going to the new services in the same church they had always attended, and the services were being conducted by the same bishops and priests they had always known. To show the parallel between the events of the 16th century and the post-conciliar period in our own day, I shall outline the Reformation in Germany the English Reformation, and briefly summarize some of the reform of today. The German Reformation. Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, was the prime mover in the destruction of the Mass in Germany. 
Let's take a look at some of his thoughts as found in his own writings. Quote, when we have overthrown the mass, we shall have overthrown the whole papacy with it. For it is upon the mass, as upon a rock, that the papacy rests, with its monasteries, its bishoprics, its colleges, its altars, its ministers, and its doctrines. All these will fall when their sacrilegious and abominable mass has crumbled into the dust. Yet in order to achieve this aim successfully and safely, it will be necessary to preserve some of the ceremonies of the ancient mass for the weak-minded, who might be scandalized by too sudden a change. At the earnest pleading of his disciples, Luther drew up his famous formula Mise. In connection with it, he said, We must state in the first place that our intention has never been to abolish divine worship, but merely to purge the form which is used of all additions which have sullied it. I am speaking of that abominable canon, Luther says, which is a confluence of slimy lagoons. They have made of the Mass a sacrifice. They have added to it offertories. The Mass is not a sacrifice. It is not the act of a sacrificing high priest. Let us regard it as a sacrament or a testament. Let us call it a blessing or Eucharist or Lord's Table or Lord's Supper or the memorial of the Lord, or give it any title we like, provided that it is not sullied by the term sacrifice or reenactment. With the canon, we discard all that implies an oblation, so that we are left with what is pure and holy. Unquote Martin Luther. Remember, that these are the words of an ordained Catholic priest. Keeping these words in mind, let us take a look at a statement that appeared in L'Osservatore Romano, the official Vatican newspaper, on October 13, 1967. Quote, Liturgical reform has taken a notable step forward on the path of ecumenism, it has come closer to the liturgical forms of the Lutheran Church." Unquote. Frightening? Luther's avowed intention was the destruction of the Mass, and he said before he died that the devil taught him Reformation. But don't get the idea that he and his followers just outright announced to the people that they were going to get rid of the Mass? If they had, the Catholic people, by and large, would certainly have opposed them. Rather, they slowly and gradually changed worship, explaining to the people that they wanted to simplify the liturgy so they could more easily understand it. The first step was a new translation of the Bible followed by the translation of the Mass from Latin into German. But Luther did not believe the Mass was a sacrifice, and he did not believe in transubstantiation, that is, that the bread and wine became substantially the body and blood of Christ. So he wrote his Formula Mise. In this new German service, Many parts of the ancient Mass were retained, but he eliminated the offertory and the consecration, and he inserted more readings from the Bible. Next, the altars were removed because they represented the sacrificial quality of the true Mass. And communion tables were moved into the sanctuaries so the priests could face the people. 
crucifixes were taken out too because they were reminders of the sacrifice of Calvary. They were replaced by plain crosses. Once Luther had opened the doors and instituted change, other priests appeared on the scene with even more drastic changes. They discarded their clerical robes, allowed the people to receive Holy Communion under both forms, permitted the laity to take the communion into their own hands and eat. They discarded Gregorian chant and the use of the organ. Instead, they promoted folk music with the use of cymbals, trumpets, and stringed instruments. These Catholic priests and monks, infected with such fierce enthusiasm for change, tore down altars, burned pictures, smashed statues, and discarded their habits. With every year that passed, the Mass was gradually changed from the reenactment of the sacrifice of Calvary to a communal gathering of the people of God. And this desecration was brought about by priests using once Catholic churches, monasteries, and convents. Most of the people were Catholic in their tradition and ideas, but as they continued to attend the perverted services in their once Catholic churches, they unknowingly were led out of the Catholic faith and into apostasy. And of course, their children, the innocent victims, exposed to the new perverted services from an early age, grew up without any real knowledge of the one true church founded by Christ. This takes on frightening implications when we recall as Catholics that the church has always taught outside of the church there is no salvation. Before we take a look at England, I would like to point out that many Protestant religions that we see today all grew out of a Catholic priest's attempt to reform the church. These churches offer no sacrifice to the infinitely holy God. They do not venerate Mary, the mother of God. They have no devotion to the angels or saints. They do not pray for the souls of their deceased relatives and friends. And all of this came about through the destruction of the holy sacrifice of the Mass by priests using once Catholic churches to do so. Luther said it was necessary to preserve some of the ceremonies of the ancient Mass for the weak-minded. Are you perhaps one of those weak-minded people who are being led blindly into apostasy? Or will you join the small group of faithful Catholics who want to remain faithful to Christ, his cross, and his teachings? If you desire to remain faithful, you will have to suffer along with Christ on Calvary in holy loneliness and ridicule and misunderstandings. But let me assure you that there are others who share these sufferings with you. The English Reformation At the beginning of the 16th century, England was a completely Catholic country, like Germany. The faith was rooted in centuries of Catholicity. All the churches were Catholic ones. Westminster Abbey, Winchester, Coventry, Canterbury were some of the principal churches of that day. And Oxford and Cambridge were centers of Catholic education. And yet, before the end of the 16th century, England was a Protestant country and the hierarchy and clergy were holding Protestant services in what was once Catholic churches. 
In our day, England is still Protestant, and the famous cathedrals such as Westminster Abbey are seats of Protestantism. How did it happen? Did it come about overnight? Did those in power in the church and the government proclaim to the people that they were going to abolish the Mass? Of course not. Any sudden action of that kind would have roused such popular resistance that it would have put them in peril. But nevertheless, the holy sacrifice of the Mass was essentially destroyed within a few years, and the Catholic people, for the most part, were not even aware of it. The man chiefly responsible for the destruction of the Mass was Thomas Cranmer, Catholic Archbishop of Canterbury. He had a passionate hatred for the Catholic theology of the Mass with its idea of a sacrificing priesthood and a sacrificial victim. He denied the doctrine of transubstantiation like Luther, that is, that the bread and wine became the body and blood of Christ at the consecration. However, as long as Henry VIII was alive, he was hypocritically, he hypocritically continued to offer Holy Mass, and he even celebrated Mass at the coronation of Edward VI, the successor of Henry in 1547. But before the year was out, Cranmer had prepared a book of homilies, which he ordered the priests to read to the people at Mass, Sunday by Sunday. These were intended to prepare the people for more drastic changes, which were to come later by presenting them with the idea that the Bible had been suppressed too long by the Church, and it was the only source of true knowledge of God. And in the churches, the priests had to read from the new translation of the Bible. The next cautious, cautious step was taken in 1548. In this change, the communion was prefaced by English exhortations in which the real and corporal presence was carefully omitted. The following year, they issued a new prayer book, the first prayer book of Edward VI. The title page read, The Supper of the Lord and Holy Communion, commonly called the Mass. The order of the service was the same as that of the Mass, but there were some things in which innovation was obvious. The first was the change in the language. The other was the change by implication in the doctrine. The change in language was the obvious challenge thrown down to the ordinary Catholics. But the appeal was made to them, surely worship should be in a language which all men understand. And the people accepted this. In the meantime, however, the doctrinal changes were of more direct and spiritual importance. Though to the average man they meant nothing and could hardly be noticed. But in this new vernacular service, they omitted not only what, whatever would emphasize the real presence, but also the sacrificial quality of the Mass. The first introduction of the new rite took place on the Feast of Pentecost in the year 1549. In the meantime, Parliament enacted a statute providing that, <clears throat> that Holy Communion should be administered under both forms. In the following year, Parliament abolished the old ritual for the ordina ordination of priests and the consecration of bishops. The new rite, composed largely by Archbishop Cranmer, eliminated every phrase or ceremony which indicated that the purpose of the rite was to confer a power of offering sacrifice. The whole purpose of the new rite was to dedicate the recipient 
as one authorized by the church to preside over the assembly of God by preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments. And the people were not even aware of this change. The communion service and the ordination rite had now been disassociated from the idea of a sacrificing priesthood. There still remained in every church, however, the silent reminder, the consecrated stone called the altar. Therefore, the bishops ordered these to be taken down and all altars destroyed. Every parish was now to provide a table of wood. They came to be known as Cranmer's Tables. The official explanation for these changes was, quote, The form of a table shall move the simple-minded from the superstitious opinion of the popist mass into the right use of the Lord's Supper. For the use of an altar is to make sacrifice upon it. The use of a table is to serve for men to eat upon." Unquote. Those brave bishops who resisted these changes were deprived of their sees. So of the 23 bishops in the country, no more than four could be counted on to champion the sacramental theology of the church and these four were imprisoned. In 1552, the king as the head of the church imposed the acts for the uniformity of common prayer and administration of the sacraments. This act decreed heavy penalties not only for those who publicly criticized the new services, but for the clergy who used any other form of worship. In the meantime, Cranmer and his associates ordered all statues to be taken out of the churches and stained glass windows demolished. They removed all the sacred vessels made of precious metals. And your guess is as good as mine where they went. They preached against the idea of Lent, the long penitential exercise in preparation for the Feast of Easter. They ridiculed the Catholic belief that the souls of deceased Christians can be aided through the sacrifice of the Mass. This account of how a once completely Catholic country became Protestant in the matter of a few years should be a warning to all of us. It can happen here and now. In fact, it has already happened. What should you do? Definitely you should stay away from these perverted services and quit contributing to the parishes that hold them because you are helping to betray Christ by supporting them in their apostasy. I have recounted briefly how the faith was undermined and destroyed in Germany and England through the gradual desecration and destruction of the Mass. To examine and condemn the errors of Luther and the other reformers, Pope Paul III convoked the Council of Trent in that same century. This council decreed that the papacy should produce and publish a missal so that priests would know what prayers to use, what ritual, and what ceremonies they were to retain in the celebration of the Mass for all time to come. This was done to safeguard all future generations of Catholics from the tragedy that befell the Catholics in Germany and England. This work was completed in the reign of Pope, Pope St. Pius V, and the Roman Missal was made the official Missal of the Church. The Pope issued his bull, the Quo Primum Decree, on the Missal, and this decree appeared in Latin in the front of every altar Missal from that time up until the recent replacement. 
I quote now from some pertinent passages of the decree quo primum. Whereas, by this present Constitution, which will be valid henceforth, now and forever, we order and enjoin that nothing must be added to our recently published missal, nothing omitted from it, nor anything whatsoever be changed within it under the penalty of our displeasure. We specifically command each and every patriarch, administrator, and all other persons of whatever ecclesiastical dignity they may be, be they even cardinals of the Holy Roman Church, or possessed of any other rank or preeminence, and we order them in virtue, virtue of holy obedience to chant or to read the Mass according to the rite and manner and norm herewith laid down by us, and hereafter to discontinue and completely discard all other rubrics and rites of other missiles, however ancient which they have customarily followed, and they must not, in celebrating Mass, presume to introduce any ceremonies or recite any prayers other than those contained in this missal. Furthermore, by these presents, in, or, in virtue of our apostolic authority, we grant and concede in perpetuity, that means for all time, that for the chanting or reading of the Mass in any church whatsoever, this missal is hereafter to be followed absolutely without any scruple of conscience or, in, or fear of incurring any penalty, judgment, or censure, and may freely and lawfully be used. Nor are superiors, administrators, canons, chaplains, and other secular priests or religious of whatever order or by whatever title designated obliged to celebrate the Mass otherwise than as enjoined by us. We likewise declare and ordain that no one whosoever is to be forced or coerced to alter this missal, and that this present document cannot be revoked or modified, but remains always valid and retain its full force. Unquote. Pertinent passages from the decree quo primum by Pope St. Pius V. As you can see, the Pope, by virtue of his apostolic authority, decreed that this Roman Missal should be used forevermore in the Church without any change or alteration, and that no priest should ever be required to offer a Holy Mass in any other way. As I have said, this was done in order to prevent the Holy Mass from ever again being destroyed as it was in Germany and England. Let no one tell you that Pope St. Pius V and the Council of Trent did not have the authority to set down rules and decrees that were to last until the end of time. And let no one tell you that a pastoral council and its implications and all of the decrees that flow therefrom can in any way whatsoever cancel out a dogmatic council which the Council of Trent was. And don't be misled by those who will tell you that another pope or council can set aside the solemn decrees of a former pope or council. If this were true, there would be no authority in the church, and we could not believe Christ's promise to be with the church all days until the end of time. Any pope or council that attempts to set aside the authoritative teachings of a previous pope or council 
is acting in deliberate defiance and disobedience to the authority of the church. Let us take a brief look at what has happened in the church since the new liturgy began. This new service, for the most part, is said in the vernacular only. Wooden communion tables have replaced the altar of sacrifice. Altar rails have been scrapped in some dioceses, the Stations of the Cross, the statues, holy water fonts, kneelers, and crucifixes have all already been taken out of all the churches. Are they gone in yours? Gregorian chant and the use of the organ have almost completely disappeared. In their place we have folk and rock services. Since all the changes, why is there no improvement? Why all the bad fruits, the confusion, the turmoil? Everything now is inside out. Revolution is in and reverence is out. Noise is the in thing. Silence is out. Immorality is in. Modesty is out. Bongos are in. Bells are out. And yes, Pentecostalism is in. True prayer is out. The table is in. The altar is out. Fallible Vatican II is in. Infallible Trent is out. Burlap banners in. Blessed statues out. Guitars are in. Gregorian chant is out. The president's chair is in. The tabernacle is out. Yes, man is in and God is out. Catholic seminaries, convents, and schools are closing. Priests and nuns are dropping out. And today, at the date of this recording in February 1974, more than 15 million Catholics in America are missing Sunday services. Why all of this? But of far greater significance is the replacement of the canon. In the new Eucharistic prayers, most of the doctrines and dogmas which were contained in the Roman Missal have been contorted or made ambiguous, and the words of the consecration have been changed in such a way that the bread and wine no longer become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the Mass has already been removed in our day, just as it was in Germany and England 400 years ago. And it was done without the Catholic people even realizing it, for the most part. It was done by the hierarchy and clergy, using Catholic churches, monasteries, and convents, exactly as was done during the Reformations in Germany and England. And the worst is yet to come. Just as the Catholics in Germany were given the formula mise of Luther and the Catholics in England were introduced to the first prayer book of Edward VI, which resulted in the complete elimination of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, we have been introduced to the new ordo. Pardon me, but I refrain from ever calling it a Mass. This new form was to become effective in every Catholic church in the world on November 30, 1969. However, two cardinals, Ottaviani and Bacchi, found the courage to oppose this destruction of the Mass, and then from some parts of Europe came the voices of courageous individuals and groups refusing to compromise with the present perversion of our holy faith. 
Catholic traditionalists in Germany, quote, This ordo mise annihilates the offertory. Remember the words of Luther? These are the pagan rites of Ceres and Bacchus. They cannot be a true Catholic mass, unquote. Monsignor Dominic Saleda in Italy, quote, the new missal contains several manifest errors explicitly condemned by previous popes. Therefore, anyone who uses this mass automatically excommunicates himself, unquote. In England, Monsignor Brian Houghton of Suffolk has publicly resigned rather than use the new liturgy, saying that were he to comply with the official directives of the bishops and Rome, he could no longer say Mass in the rite for which he was ordained. And this quote from Bishop Antonio de Castro Meyer of Brazil in a pastoral letter, 1972, quote, Therefore, in full harmony with the Church, all priests may continue to celebrate the traditional Mass of St. Pius V. Unquote. And the Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, head of the Seminary of St. Pius X, Switzerland, quote, In this new conception of the Mass, nothing remains. It is a Protestant conception and leads to Protestantism. It is for this reason that I cannot conceive the possibility of creating a seminary with the new Mass." Unquote. In the official prayer book issued in Rome, this new service is referred to as the Lord's Supper and the Memorial of the Lord. It is no longer necessary for the priest to use an altar stone, and the priest is called the President of the Assembly of the People of God. Worst of all, no priest permitted, is permitted to offer the Latin Mass of St. Pius V publicly. It has been outlawed illegally. Okay. Again, what should you do? If you desire to remain a true Catholic, do you think that you in conscience can support these new services? Can you, according to your Catholic conscience, contribute to church men who have apostatized from the true church? It is realized this entails terrible sacrifice. But you can be assured that there are others suffering along with you in this struggle. Pray along with us to the most blessed Virgin Mary to whom God has given the power to crush all heresies and one day the true church will again emerge from the catacombs. Pope St. Pius V ordered the perpetual use of the Tridentine Mass in 1570 with the promulgation of his apostolic bull, Quo Primum. Chronologically, 1570 was after Luther of Germany and Cranmer of England had instituted their misleading so-called reforms. Pope St. Pius V gave us a Mass we knew was valid and could rely on even through turmoil. Who would want to destroy this true Mass? The creature who undoubtedly hates the true Mass and wants its destruction is Satan. Would it be reasonable for legitimate church authorities to cooperate with Satan in this matter? Can you, as an informed Catholic, agree to the answers I give to these following questions? 
One, do you know that the new service in your churches is not Catholic? Two, do you know that the Mass can never be changed? Three, do you know that the new Ordo was devised with the help of six Protestant ministers? Four, do you know that the one that once the church has spoken on a matter of faith and morals, that it stands for all time? Five, do you know that the table being used in the new ordo has been condemned previously by more than 12 popes? Six, do you know that when the experts changed the words of the consecration, they changed the form of the sacrament and thereby invalidated the sacrament and the Mass? Question 1 about the new service in your church. Again, what is the Mass? The Mass is the same sacrifice as the sacrifice of the cross because the offering and the priest are the same. Christ our blessed Lord. And the ends for which the sacrifice of the Mass is offered are the same as those of the sacrifice of the cross. Would you not, just using your common sense, associate an altar with a sacrifice and a table with a meal? Well then, I ask, have you been attending a meal or a sacrifice. I will grant you the fact that the Holy Eucharist was ins instituted at the Last Supper, but not until after the meal was over. The Holy Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Protestants have always celebrated what they called a meal or memorial, and received a piece of bread in memory of Christ and the Last Supper. This was condemned as heresy by the Council of Trent. Catholics, on the contrary, have always had the greatest gift of God on the face of the earth within their reach, the true presence of Christ in Holy Communion. The doctrine of transubstantiation has been guarded very carefully by all the popes and all the councils down through history. Never in the history of the Catholic Church has it been known as a meal until Vatican II. Each part of the true Mass represents something in the Passion of our Lord. The new Catholic Dictionary published in 1929 states on page 164 the essential part, the consecration, has always been the same from the time of the apostles. The arrangement of the ceremonies and prayers dates with very slight change from the 6th century. On page 833, as far as the Mass is concerned, it is practically the same today as in the time of Gregory the Great. That's over 1,380 years. During the Middle Ages, the Roman Rite branched out into a great number of other rites, differing only in unimportant details. Most of these derived rites were abolished by Pope St. Pius V with his Quo Primum in 1570. In the New Ordo, everything is ambiguously inverted. The new things represent no thing, nothing. Can you see what has been taken away from you? Have you noticed the immodesty since the Mass has been replaced? The irreverence? 
recall to mind that during the Protestant Reformation, the people continued to attend the new services in the same buildings where Mass was formerly offered. And they all lost their faith, their own and the generations that followed them. On the second question, do you know that the Mass can never be changed? After the Reformation, Pope St. Pius V did not invent a Mass. He fixed the Mass for all times when he promulgated the Bull Quo Primum. This was to prevent what happened in 1969, and until this decree, until then, this decree appeared in every altar missal from the year 1570 on. I quote here further important portions of that document. Therefore, no one whatsoever is permitted to alter this letter or heedlessly dare go contrary to this notice of our permission, statute, ordination, command, precept, grant, indult, declaration, will, decree, and prohibition. Should anyone, however, presume to commit such an act, he should know that he has incurred the wrath of Almighty God and the blessed apostles Peter and Paul. Now right away it comes to your mind. If Pope St. Pius V could fix the Mass, why can't Paul VI, who is also a Pope, do the same thing? Did he do the same thing? And a point of much deeper consideration, a Pope is the Vicar of Christ on earth, and we certainly all know that Christ cannot contradict himself. If one Pope, by virtue of his apostolic authority, commands something in perpetuity for all times, that's what it means.